Long, long ago, in a time before the light of ray tracing lit up our game worlds, I got to play a lot of my uncle's PC games. I got my first taste of real-time strategy with Command and & Conquer and Dungeon Keeper. This was different from anything I had played before. It was kind of a hybrid of genres, taking some of the best aspects of different games that blends them all together for something special. Me and my friends were completely addicted. So what is Dungeon Keeper? You might not have ever seen this over 25 year old classic PC game. Well, put it this way, have you ever wondered what it would be like to be an evil overlord of hordes of demons and monsters? That's pretty much what you get to do here. This is an isometric real time strategy game. You play as a dungeon keeper and you will manage a demonic dungeon as well as the monstrosities that choose to live in your dungeon. While part real time strategy, the other half of the game is sim management. Think like The Sims, but instead of human beings, you're managing evil monsters. Wow. Demons, dragons, undead, each with their own personalities, jobs, relationships, and interests. The main campaign is the meat of Dungeon Keeper. It's made up of stages, and your goal? To conquer the land from below and purge the land of any good guys as well as any rival Dungeon Keepers. You are pure evil, but the game doesn't take itself super serious. It's not edgy and there's plenty of comedy. Well, some dark comedy. As a keeper, you'll manage a dungeon with your big green hand. You can pick stuff up, drop stuff, and also administer slaps to motivate creatures into working harder. Some of your dark mistresses might skip training and instead choose to amuse themselves and get their asses whipped in your torture chambers so you'll need to administer some of those slaps to get them back to work. That's the kind of dark comedy we're working with here. On the topic, consider slamming that like button below. Any support will be deeply appreciated. I'm trying to grow the channel. Dungeon Keeper is a very unique strategy game, and while it spawned a sequel and some spiritual successes, I still feel like this is a very underappreciated and underrepresented subgenre of real-time strategy. I love it, and there aren't enough games like this. While Dungeon Keeper was published by EA, it was developed by Bullfrog Productions. Bullfrog might ring a bell if you have any taste in retro strategy games. They're a British game studio that left behind a pretty epic legacy. Theme Park, Theme Hospital, Popular Syndicate, and well, Dungeon Keeper. Whenever you saw that little black frog on the game cover, you knew it would be some crazy fun strategy game. These developers weren't afraid to make use of crazy fun ideas, and you can tell their games were made with a lot of passion. So much passion that Dungeon Keeper itself was made in just over two years. The main producer and designer Peter Molyneux is another big name that might sound familiar if you follow the games industry. What we're going to be doing is focusing on a few features and polishing those to the highest possible level we can. And the first feature I spoke about was how come the screen's gone black. Molyneux, like a lot of other developers, was not happy with working under the more corporate publisher, Electronic Arts. He intended to leave as soon as Dungeon Keeper was complete, but EA wasn't having this and asked Molyneux to leave his offices. Believe it or not, being so passionate about finishing Dungeon Keeper, the Bullfrog team actually left the EA offices and worked from Peter Molyneux's house instead. Later down the line, EA eventually cancelled Dungeon Keeper 3's development and completely dissolved Bullfrog's existence. This was a trend for EA. There's a horrifyingly long list of games companies and successful franchises they would acquire and twist their games into garbage and awful mobile games. But because these franchises became a shadow of their former selves, profits went right down. And with little to no profits, EA ends up closing down each gaming studio one by one. It sucks, but at least a lot of these original Bullfrog developers went on to form Lionhead Studios, where we got Black and White and the Fable series. Returning to Dungeon Keeper today, the first thing that's going to hit you hard are the visuals. They're low resolution, really pixelated, and just like mouldy bread, these graphics are past their sell-by date. In fact, it's so old, it's easier to emulate Microsoft DOS and run the game through DOS than getting it to work with modern versions of Windows. This is actually how digital stores sell Dungeon Keeper. It comes with its own automated Microsoft DOS emulator. Kinda crazy. There is a Windows version of the game, but it's just less hassle to emulate DOS. You have to give it a chance though and put up with the visuals. This is 25 years old. Basically the game works as a 3D world with characters in the form of 2D sprites. 
but game objects are rotated to give the illusion they're actually 3D models. Introducing you to the world is the opening cinematic. We get a sneak peek of life above ground and the human hero, the Lord of the Land, who wanders into a dungeon and slaughters his way through troll workers before being decapitated by a horned reaper. A horned reaper is one of Dungeon Keeper's most powerful creatures. We are the evil badasses here and we're going to mess with the good guys. Evil is good. <laughs> we select our stage through an overworld map. Our own dark mentor narrates and gives us a description of each stage. From ever smile to snuckle den, cozy turn, our mentor usually mentions how happy, wonderful and magical each location is and how friendly and whimsical its inhabitants are, before instructing you to slaughter them all. Ever smile. Set in the realm of joy, the people of Ever smile are plagued only by aching facial muscles, and not anthrax as we had hoped. Ever smile is a disgusting land of good humor and polite frivolity. It is pretty brilliant. As you conquer each piece of land, you'll see the entire map slowly transform into a fiery hellscape. Dungeon Keeper is all about the fantasy of being pure evil in style, but it doesn't take itself too seriously. You've got your traditional top-down view, which is great for managing your dungeon, but check this. You can use magic to possess minions and explore your own dungeon in first-person view. Different creatures see the world differently, while giant flies have their creepy mosaic-like fly vision, Hellhounds can only see in black and white, while vampires see the world in a red scale. To say this game has a lot of attention to detail would be an understatement. Ultimately, you need to build and maintain the ultimate dungeon to attract all sorts of weird and powerful creatures to live, fight for you, and even work in your dungeon. Imps are at the core of your workforce. Well, I guess they're more like slaves since you don't actually pay them any wages. Imps will follow your orders, dig out tiles, mine gold, and reinforce your dungeon. You can spend a bit of gold and build up various rooms that attract and provide services for various creatures. So the base game has 20 main stages. That's 20 regions of the overworld filled with friendly good guys that need slaughtered and their land twisted to hell. And we're going to do all this from underground. You never actually go above ground in Dungeon Keeper 1 or even 2. The games take place entirely in your underground dungeons. But above ground gameplay was actually going to be a feature of Dungeon Keeper 3. That is until EA cancelled it. While Bullfrog was dismantled and Dungeon Keeper destroyed, Dungeon Keeper was eventually resurrected by EA and Mythic Entertainment. Yeah! But hold on, resurrected as a mobile game. Boo! It was infested with pay to win and microtransactions, hot garbage and disrespectful to the Dungeon Keeper IP. The Horned Reaper himself even gives you shit for not purchasing in-game speedups. The mobile game was met mostly with negativity, and was even described as a cancer of the games industry. Hello darkness, my old friend. I just choose to pretend this version of Dungeon Keeper never even existed. Back to the good times. The wonderful land of Eversmile is where your campaign begins. Dungeon Keeper doesn't have some arbitrary tutorial. You teach yourself as you play, the way I like it. You're gradually introduced to more and more mechanics as you progress the game. It gives the campaign a sense of progression, and it keeps things feeling fresh with good pacing. You get access to the basics here, a lair for creatures to live in, a hatchery to produce tasty chickens to feed creatures, turns out there's no vegetarian creatures, and a treasury to store your gold. You're introduced to the beetle and fly creatures. While the flies make for good scouts for uncovering the map, they're both really weak starting creatures, but you've got to make use of what you've got. You're quickly attacked by dirty dwarven miners who eventually dig into your dungeon, and eventually the Lord of the Land himself. Beware, the Lord of the Land approaches. We shall not tolerate your evil presence any longer. Your creatures are attacking the enemy. On most stages, your mission objective is to just simply defeat this Lord of the Land, while the Lord of the Land's goal is to destroy your dungeon heart. At the core of any dungeon is the dungeon heart. This can be attacked by good guys and heroes. The Lord of the Land is going to march straight for your dungeon heart, and once it's destroyed, it's game over. So you'll want strong creatures to protect your dungeon heart. 
Your minions are winning a battle. You have conquered this realm. With the Lord of the Land dead, the region has been conquered. You can move on to the next one. Corsiton. Ah, This one introduces you to your first fighter, the Demon Spawn. These scaly little demons love to make use of your new training room. You pay a regular small fee to allow creatures to train in your training room and to level up. The training room is the most effective way of powering up your creatures and preparing for the Lord of the Land to attack. Thing is, there's only so much gold available in a stage and you also need to pay your creatures wages. In later stages it's much more important to balance your gold spending. But the Lord of the Land's forces are no match for the freshly trained Demon Spawn. In later levels, if a Demon Spawn reaches level 10, it'll evolve into a fully fledged dragon, a much more advanced creature. This was a cool little trick I learned from the manual. Remember when games used to actually have manuals? Dungeon Keeper is not perfect. The combat has a few issues, like it's very difficult to fully control your armies of creatures and order them to attack enemies. I would break the combat down into three main ways of attacking. You could possess creatures and lead the attack yourself, or you could pick up eight of your creatures and drop them near enemies, or you can use the Call to Arm spell. Your creatures are attacking the enemy. This spell costs a lot of gold to maintain, but it creates a magic banner and all your creatures will slowly head to the banner and prepare for war and engage the enemy. But it can sometimes be a bit finicky getting your creatures to attack the enemy and stay engaged. If you build a barracks, creatures can group up together as a squad. If you possess a creature in the barracks, the other creatures in the barracks will follow you around, and even follow you into battle. A nifty way of letting you personally lead skirmishes against the enemy. This is a little trick I didn't learn till years later. There's something really satisfying about knowing these are the creatures that you've been training and preparing all this time. They each have their own names, blood types, and maybe their own little stories, like Fap the Vampire here. No joke, Fap was his randomly generated name. I'll tell you more about this champion later, but you really don't want them to die. You don't necessarily have to take part in regular combat. You could play more defensively and layer your dungeon with traps. There was this one mission I was able to complete with only using spells. I didn't actually need to use my creatures. Speaking of spells, the third stage brings in the research mechanic. Through our libraries, warlocks are recruited, and these bookworms love to spend all their time researching new rooms and spells. From this point on, every new stage will require you to research the more advanced spells and rooms, as in you lose all your research in between stages. It's not as bad as it sounds, but it makes libraries a very important room that you're going to want to make use of in every stage. Warlocks are pretty cool too. At level 1 they're absolutely useless fighters, but throw them in the training room and they'll start developing new spells and become effective long range fighters. While everyone else is smashing things in the face, Warlocks will take a back seat and fling magical projectiles into the battle. It is fun unlocking new creature types. There's almost an element of discovery as you level creatures up and discover what new abilities or spells they'll learn. From fireballs to really useful self-healing spells that make all the difference in combat. Also, there's quite a few secrets to discover in the campaign. And to be honest, you can usually predict where they are on the map by gaps in the bedrock. Like around here. You can also make use of the Sight of Evil spell to scope it out and see if there's any treasures or bonuses to be dug out. On this stage I managed to find a training room and two skeleton recruits which are creatures not normally obtainable until later in the campaign. A pretty cool reward for taking the extra time to explore the level and a little sneak peek of creatures to come. Flower Hat is the fourth stage and changes things up. We're no longer playing a defensive role waiting to be invaded by the good guys. This time we get to make the offensive plays. Thanks to the gem supply near our dungeon, we can take our time and over prepare. Gem nodes work just like gold, but unlike gold, gems never deplete and provide us a slow but infinite supply of wealth. To be honest, I prefer stages that have gems. While it's a nice challenge trying to make use of limited resources, with gems you'll never have to worry about running out of gold, and you can play at a much more leisurely pace and build up your dream dungeon and fighting force. But the real treat on this stage is access to workshops, which allow you to recruit sweaty green trolls to tirelessly produce traps and doors to reinforce your dungeon. If you focus on the workshop you can produce poison gas traps that choke enemies, lightning traps that electrocute, and dangerous boulder traps to crush enemies. Just be careful boulders don't backfire and crush your own creatures. But traps are very effective. 
cram a few together and they can completely wipe out invading heroes. This is one of the first stages I got completely sucked into. General gameplay is already really addictive, like the base building, managing your creatures and all those sim elements, but thanks to gems you could lock yourself in your bedroom all day and play the same level, building up the perfect dungeon and creatures. You kind of just lose track of time and forget to actually go for the objectives. It's great just playing endlessly and having fun with the sim management stuff. I think the developers picked up on this because in Dungeon Keeper 2 they added in a new mode, My Pet Dungeon. This mode does not have any objectives, it's just a sandbox where you can play endlessly with access to unlimited resources to build up your perfect pet dungeon. Creature AI is surprisingly good. The creatures are really good at just living their lives in the dungeon, doing their tasks or moving between rooms like the lair and the hatchery to rest and get food. No matter how complex you design your dungeon, if there's a path to their objective, your creatures will travel it. This side of the AI is almost flawless, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend Dungeon Keeper is a perfect game. Enemy AI is not quite as intelligent, and something I find frustrating is the AI behind mining. So those gem veins I mentioned earlier, only three imps can mine away at the side of gems at once. But because gems are an infinite source of wealth, when you give the order to mine gems, your imps sometimes get a little confused. Despite only three imps being needed to mine the gems, even if you have over 30 imps, they all become a little bit confused and become much slower at performing all their other tasks because their AI is constantly telling them to mine the gems, despite other imps being on the job already. Just a little nitpick of mine, it does not break the game or my enjoyment of it. Lush Meadow on Down marks your first challenge against a rival keeper, instead of the regular good guys and Lord of the Land. Turns out, you are not just purging the land of good guys, you need to compete against other bad guys for control of the land. You're actually fighting a keeper who plays very differently by building up their own dungeon and creatures. In this mission, there's a river of lava separating you from the enemy dungeon, but regretfully there's no gems to be mined, so we're back to a limited supply of gold unlike the previous stage. Bile demons are one of the first more advanced creatures you can recruit. These fat asses need a lot of living space and food, but they do serve as powerful defensive fighters, and being full of bile, they… well… they're full of gas and their poisonous gas attacks can harm the enemy and friendly units caught in their stink. What a classy recruit to add to our ranks. But an even bigger treat is access to the prisons. Just need to enable the option to imprison. Now when we defeat enemies we'll leave them unconscious so imps can drag their bodies back to our prisons. The prisoners flesh will slowly run away and the dead creatures will serve us as skeletons. Tireless minimum wage fighters that don't even need feeding. A prisoner has died and risen as a skeleton. But there is a bit of risk reward to doing this. For one, if we fail to bring unconscious enemies back to our prison fast enough, then they'll wake up and continue the fight. And if enemies siege our dungeon, they can cause a prison break and free all our prisoners. So there's an element of risk in running a prison, but well worth the extra effort to add armies of skeletons to existing ranks of creatures. Hell, if you want it, you could make a skeleton focused dungeon and throw all your creatures into prison so they'll become skeletons. Not the best plan, but it's awesome you have the option to do this. So, seems all good, but it turns out the fatty bile demons do not get along with the skinny skeletons, and they will fight and kill each other. It might be a thin versus fat thing. The game never clearly teaches you this, but they only fight each other because they share the same living space. If you separate skeletons and bile demons into separate lairs, they won't be so hostile to each other. I couldn't find any mention of this in the instruction manual either. So in 1997 before in-depth wikis, it was something you were expected to discover yourself. You're also introduced to spiders, which are pretty low tier fighters, but after a little bit of training they can slow and freeze enemies up with their webs, which is pretty useful in combat, especially when alongside other creatures. I will say, there is a really surprising depth to the sim management side of Dungeon Keeper. Every creature in your dungeon is unique, they even have their own blood type and names, like Fap the Vampire. Creatures have their own quirks and flaws too. For example, as warlocks become more and more powerful, they'll gain access to powerful spells, but they will also become more arrogant and fling spells at noisy creatures that pass through your library and disturb the silence. So you have to design your dungeon in a way that your library is isolated and creatures won't have to pass through and disturb research in the library. Creatures have different relationships with different types of creatures. Overweight bile demons might pick fights with skinny skeletons, or vampires might be disgusted by warlocks and they will try to slaughter each other. 
Moving on to the cute and cuddly land of Snuggledell. This is a pretty appropriate name for this land because this is where you get to expand on your prison system and learn to build torture chambers. Snuggledell is full of fresh victims ripe for torturing. God, I love how evil this game is. So, any prisoners you capture, you can manually pick them up and drop them into a torture chamber slot. The torture chambers will automatically refashion themselves to torture the prisoner in the worst way possible. From painfully stretching elf ears, repeatedly turning wizards into frogs using their own wands, or just beating them with a huge hammer. Torture victims can divulge useful information. Information has been tortured from the enemy. Like unveiling a little bit of the map, or if they die during the torture, they'll then save you in death as a ghost type creature. Thing is, we can be really evil and use a healing spell to keep our torture victims alive. And instead of dying and becoming ghosts, we can break their mind and convert them onto our side as dark heroes. So if you manage to capture any prisoners, you have the choice between letting them rot and become skeletons, or torturing them to death for ghosts, or you can try to convert them to your side. As a keeper, you have the agency to decide what's best or most needed in your dungeon. I like to personally go to my prisons and pick out the captors that look like useful fighters or good additions to my workforce. I treat it like a pick and mix and throw these guys into my torture chambers to convert them, while the rest of the rabble I'll leave to suffer slowly and they'll serve me in death as skeletons. One of the reasons I love Dungeon Keeper is the depth. You're not just limited to your creatures, demons and undead. You can fill your dungeon with heroes and corrupt servants of the light and that is awesome that's even an option. But there is one side effect. A lot of your more evil minions are going to struggle with getting along with the ex-heroes. The torture chambers also entice dark mistresses to your dungeon. These naughty mid-range fighters are pretty twisted and love to spend their time amusing themselves in your torture chambers. No joke, you sometimes need to slap them back to work. The kinky dark mistresses are actually the only creature that enjoys being slapped and they'll even become happier after a slap. The next stage ups the difficulty by having you face both an enemy keeper and the heroes with their lord of the land. The key to these kind of maps is to make use of your newly acquired rooms. You can defeat and capture the forces of one enemy, then convert them to your side and bolster your forces so you can then take care of the rest of the enemies. I generally prefer facing heroes to an enemy keeper. The heroes are much more unique with units spread out through the level and it's fun capturing them. While once you've reached an enemy keeper's dungeon it gets a bit messy, so I choose to go for the heroes first here. This time you'll get access to the barracks, which allows you to group units together. It's pretty effective when you possess a unit in the barracks, and all other units from the barracks will then follow you into battle. With the barracks comes the orcs, which are pretty much big pink trolls. Not quite as effective as their counterparts in the workshop, but solid melee fighters. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! <laughs> tend to try and replace my trolls with orcs if I can. While trolls are slightly better at crafting traps, they're so weak they're not even worth sending into battle. Unlike the orcs who can put up a good fight. Ah, uh, Tickle might just be the most adorable name for a region yet. Ironically, this is where the most powerful creature in your arsenal comes into play. You get access to the temple room type, a place for unhappy creatures to find comfort. But the temple has a secondary function, you can drop things into the temple's waters to make sacrifices to the gods for rewards. It's a process of trial and error discovering what combinations of sacrifices give what rewards. In a future stage, the game subtly hints to try sacrificing a troll, pile demon and dark mistress. This combination of sacrifices will please the gods, who will reward you with a horned reaper, the most powerful evil creature in the game. The gods are pleased with your sacrifice. The gods have rewarded your offering. Apart from really needing some pants, these guys get angry. Seriously, very angry and hostile very quickly. They're the embodiment of anger. That's my secret, cat. I'm always angry. You need to keep them busy or shower them with gold to keep them content. They are a bit of a risk-reward type creature. The Horned Reaper's head might seem familiar, and that's because it's plastered across the Dungeon Keeper series. He is the very logo and front cover for Dungeon Keeper 1. This handsome chap leading the charge led to an easy victory over the land of Tickle. I mentioned earlier, your mentor provides a little narration and introduction to each region of the land, describing how nice and fluffy its inhabitants are. Blissfully unaware of the damage protracted war can wreak on their idyllic cluster of homesteads, 
And the villagers of Tickle are pure of heart and unblemished of face and neck. But once you finish the stage, you'll also get a little bit of narration on what has happened to the region once you've taken over it. Once a flourishing homestead, now it's a stinking hole in the ground. It will be years before even the hardiest weed grows here again. War, on the other hand, is in full blossom. Sick. Moonbrush Wood brought back some memories. It's one of my favourite stages. It's a cosy snow region with access to gems, which instantly makes the level addictive since I won't have to worry about running out of gold. You just need to slowly work your way through hordes of heroes at your own pace, with powerful wizards and sorceresses hiding in their four libraries before the Lord of the Land comes to finish you off. This is also the introduction to graveyards. Imps will carry friendly and enemy corpses to graves. Once enough corpses have decomposed, my favourite creature, a vampire, will rise from the graves. Very powerful all-round fighters with loads of spells, they can fly, teleport, drain health, but best of all, they are immortal. If they are defeated, instead of dying they lose a level and are resurrected in their lair. The only downside to vampires is that they clash with friendly warlocks, but to be honest I'd happily let the vampires kill off my warlocks, since vampires can research in the library in place of warlocks. But one way to help prevent scobbles in your dungeon is to design your dungeon to accommodate the various creatures and their relationship issues. Build separate living spaces and try to keep certain creature types from clashing, which can be difficult when you're sometimes working with limited space. Towards the end of this level, I find a bonus that lets me transfer any one of my creatures to the start of the next stage with me, so I opt to take my strongest vampire. It just so happens that in the next stage, Nevergrim, the only thing between you and the enemy keeper is some lava. So, making a 200 IQ play, I possess my vampire I carried over from the previous stage and fly over to greet the enemy. I was able to easily crush low level creatures and destroy the enemy dungeon heart before they could really do anything. You need to build a lair for your creatures. You have conquered this realm. While originally this stage may have took me all day first time through, it's very satisfying to crush this in less than 4 minutes. Well, the next stage half did not go so well for me. This has got to be one of the most challenging stages in the game, especially considering this stinker is only halfway through the game. If you ask me, this stage is a bit overtuned and might have needed a bit more time being tested by the developers. You start with a somewhat already established base, and you're very quickly under siege from heroes from four directions. It is absolutely brutal rushing around and micromanaging very limited forces. There is very limited time between waves of enemies. You'll struggle to let your minions fully recover and rest in their lairs. I didn't get the win first time around, but when I did, it was a hard fought victory. I believe this is the first time you get access to the final room, the scavenger room. Not that you'd have any time to properly explore how it works in this stage. Creatures that work in the scavenger room slowly influence similar enemy creatures to defect and turn to your side. It takes a lot of time, it's expensive, and originally it wasn't clear how it even worked, so I'm not a huge fan of the scavenger room and I don't make too much use of it. But I can't be the only one who did not scavenge, because it's one of the few rooms that did not carry over to Dungeon Keeper 2. The scavenger room also attracts hellhounds. They're good boys and make for great scouts, but aren't the greatest fighters, so they'll often wander about scouting and engage enemies it cannot defeat. Hellhounds will also urinate on corpses in your graveyard. Turns out the urine helps corpses decompose faster, so you can get more vampires. Elf's Dance has you against two rival keepers as well as hordes of heroes. This is where my champion, Fap the Vampire's origin story begins, and God bless him. After training Fap up, I was able to possess him and sneak into each keeper's dungeon and destroy their hearts for an easy win. But I've got an even more creative way of taking over the next region, Sleepyburg. Again, you're against two enemy keepers. This time the Lord of the Land is behind them. Thanks to gem veins providing a steady supply of gold, I was able to complete the level just purely from using magic. The Sight of Evil spell can be used to reveal the heroes and Lord of the Land's location. And from there, I just electrocuted them all with a lightning bolt spell. Since gold wasn't an issue, I wiped out all the heroes for a sneaky easy win. Another notable stage was Woodley Rhyme, where you can get access to the Armageddon spell, which is probably the most fun spell in the game alongside Possession. Armageddon has a hefty cost, 
But when it's cast, it'll trigger an epic final battle at your dungeon heart, where all creatures good and bad are teleported to your dungeon heart for a final deciding battle. Again, access to easy gem veins means you can take this stage at your own pace and trigger the Armageddon spell when you feel fully prepared. The tentacle is the final creature that makes its appearance across the final few levels. It's a really weird creature. They're pretty decent fighters and similar to spiders that can stun enemies with their freeze ability, which is really useful against powerful enemies. Missile provides you a pre-built dungeon with everything you need except access to a training room, and it was a pretty fun challenge slowly pushing your way through the well-crafted level, making use of everything you have. Without a training room, it removes the ability to level up your creatures, which is normally critically important, so you have to be extra creative with what you've got. Skybird Trill is the grand finale, the final stage of Dungeon Keeper. We face off against the final boss, the Avatar, who leads the heroes. But there's also an enemy keeper who wants the Avatar for himself. Praise the Dark God, Skybird Trill has easy access to loads of gems. And these gems make this the best stage to play to build up your dream dungeon. Dungeon Keeper is all about agency, there's no correct way to play. This is your best opportunity to build up your dream dungeon, and you can design it the way you want and have your own playstyle, or focus on creature types you like the most. When I first started Dungeon Keeper, I'd just make a mess of a dungeon with open spaces and a mess of different rooms all clashing with each other. But with a bit of time and experience, I learned how to refine the dungeons, and now I like to separate rooms and fill corridors between them with traps and doors. Having a well-organized dungeon makes everything a lot more efficient and keeps your creatures happy. When designing a dungeon, I like to do a bit of everything. Get some dragons, vampires, I like to try and capture a lot of enemy heroes. There's just something really addictive about all this base building and sim management. I'll just find myself spending countless hours just building up my dungeons and creatures, and I'll forget to actually go for the actual objectives. But there might have been a bit of a problem here, because on this final level, while I was taking my time, the enemy keeper managed to defeat the heroes and capture the avatar himself. I had to sneak around to the back of the Keeper's dungeon to his prison, where I had to fight and defeat the imprisoned Avatar. The Avatar is the most powerful hero and creature in the game. Once he's finally defeated, there's no rest for the wicked. A message pops up that the heroes have resurrected the Avatar and are launching a final attack on your dungeon. It was a pretty tough final battle. I made use of lots of high level dragons, healing them with magic when needed, and I could do some pretty massive damage by possessing the dragons and spamming their fire breath. Once you've defeated the Avatar and before ending the game, you can actually imprison him and convert him to your side. He's useless because you've beat the game already, but it's kind of cool exploring how he works and seeing what abilities he has. With the ending, you're treated to the final cinematic celebration, where Trolls and the Horned Reaper are torturing the Avatar. One troll has a withered staff and transforms the Avatar into... well... <laughs> Hover, hover! You couldn't ask for a more evil and twisted fate for our nemesis. I love it. While that's the end of the core Dungeon Keeper experience with its campaign, an expansion pack was actually released in the same year, Deeper Dungeons. Turns out the final boss, the Avatar, is once again resurrected, and he's retaken land and reformed the hero's armies for 15 new stages. I'm still learning new things about Dungeon Keeper even today. Did you know that if you drop a chicken into a prison, the prisoners will fight each other over the chicken? This game is just made from loads of crazy ideas and passion. I seriously doubt many people will make it this far into the video. I'm still learning how to make this stuff more engaging. But thank you, I'm honoured if you're still here. I wanted to recommend something different that's been almost lost to time. Real-time strategy is one of my favourite game genres, but we don't get many of them these days. Maybe my love for RTS stems from playing Dungeon Keeper so early on. While EA might have dismantled Bullfrog and butchered the Dungeon Keeper franchise, I'll keep praying to the Dark Gods that one day we get a proper Dungeon Keeper 3. Till then, I've got the spiritual successor War for the Overworld, which is great, and the Dungeon series, which explores and experiments with gameplay above ground. But the Dungeons games are a little bit cringy with just too many references and memes at its core. That's been Dungeon Keeper. Peace for now.